Thank you, Stephen and Melissa, uh, for that amazing opening. There's more references, I would say. Are, are we on? Perfect. You hear me okay? Fantastic. Uh, there was many, many references there in the songs to the, some of the thoughts and passages we hope to bring out to you today. So we trust that that's the Lord working in our hearts. Uh, as was mentioned uh, during the intro, but also during the break, at Read of You Now, we're going through a study of 2 Corinthians. However, before we turn to 2 Corinthians 4, I would actually invite you to turn in the Old Testament to Judges chapter 7. So we're going to begin there. In 2 Corinthians, Jerry Libby was here the last <clears throat> couple weeks, finishing up chapter 3 and beginning chapter 4 with us. And uh, very powerful uh, thoughts that were shared on that. And if you, if you missed it and are interested, they are on our website, or you can subscribe to podcasts or whatever to, to catch up on that. But we will be breaking back into the middle of chapter 4 of 2 Corinthians in a moment. But a lot of the principle of the message today surrounds the idea that there is an external and an internal part of your body and your soul, your existence as a Christian. And while one could be falling apart, the external, the internal can be renewed. One you see, physically speaking, one you don't. One, it talks about a treasure uh, hidden in a, in a jar of clay, something not very exciting or dramatic or drawing much attention to itself. A lot of focus on the external and the internal. That reference to the jar of clay, though, I can't help but wonder if Paul, inspired by the Spirit, his mind was drawn back here to Judges chapter 7. So we're going to read a couple of verses to draw out one principle that will guide us through, I trust, our message this morning in 2 Corinthians 4. So it's Judges 7. If it has been a while since you have looked at this, we're jumping midway, we're going to jump in at verse 15 here, where God's judge, God's hero Gideon, was uh, received message via a dream that he would be uh, attacking and being victorious over the Midianites who were terrorizing the children of Israel. <clears throat> and I want you to notice how they attacked and specifically look for this, this jar of clay that was used by Gideon in, in Judges 7. So verse 15, it was so. When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and the interpretation thereof that he worshipped and returned to the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered into our hands the host of Midian. He divided 300 men into three companies, put a trumpet in each man's hand, and with empty pitchers, there's your jar of clay, and lamps within these pitchers. And he said to them, Look at me, and do likewise. Behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so you shall do. When I blow with the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow you all the trumpets, all on every side of the camp, and say, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And so Gideon and the hundred men that were with him came into the outside of the camp, the beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch. They blew the trumpets, broke the pitchers that were in their hands, and the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands, the trumpets in their right to blow, and they cried the sword of the Lord and Gideon. we we'll stop there. If you didn't have any clue what we're reading, they're attacking, middle of the night. The element of surprise was critical here, and so he invited them to take a torch, a lamp of some time, take a clay jar, cover it, smash that thing and we're going to cry trumpets all of this is going to happen at once and it's going to be such a shock and they would have the victory but the principle that i want us to see is this the light was only seen when the container was broken the light was seen when the container was broken now you might think well isn't that obvious well there's a there's a trend there's a thread of that and now as we transition if you will to second corinthians 4 the light is seen as the container is broken, <clears throat> that I trust we will see and reflect on together. Second Corinthians chapter 4, and uh, Jerry left off at the end of verse 6 last week. We're going to begin at verse 7 of Second Corinthians 4 today. We're going to read the remainder of the chapter, and then as I like to do, we'll, we'll go back and we'll walk through it together and see some thoughts that I trust the Lord has for us. So, remember, the light is seen when the container is broken. Second Corinthians 4 verse 7. 
but we, we have this treasure in earthen vessels or in jars of clay, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled <clears throat> on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed and not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we who live, <clears throat> excuse me, we who live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, and the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death works in us, but life in you. We having this same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore I spoke, we also believe, and therefore speak. Knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and present us with you. All things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many increase to the glory of God. For which cause we do not faint. Though our outward person perishes, the inward is renewed day by day. For our light afflictions, which are for a moment, work for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things that are seen, but the things which are not seen. The things which are seen are temporary. The things which are not seen are eternal. If you haven't read that passage in a while, I, I, uh, I certainly would expect and would allow you to say, boy, there's a lot in there and I don't really know what the point of it is. A lot of words, a lot of phrases. Uh, believe me, I struggled with that very aspect as well. But the thought of it is it here. If I could summarize simply as this, as we start into this together. If you have decided to side with Jesus Christ today, that if he is your Lord and Savior and you want to be on his side, you have something very, very precious inside you. That is what we read about here in verse 7. We, this is speaking of Christians, have this treasure in earthen vessels or in jars of clay. So what is this treasure? Well, if you look back earlier in the chapter, verse 2 it talked about the truth. Verse 4, the light of the gospel. Verse 6, the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. It, it's, it's all of these things somewhat wrapped together, but it's this. It is the truth, the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's more than just a message. This isn't a, this verse here in verse 7, this isn't saying that it's like in school when you would pass a secret message around the classroom that you have a secret message hidden inside you, simply words. The gospel is a lot more than words. The gospel transforms life. Anything good about me today before God, the glory goes to him. It's him changing my life on the inside. I look out <clears throat> at a room of people here today. I don't mean this to be demeaning, but honestly, it looks no different from the outside than if I found a crowd of people anywhere else. We could go to a large mall and see a large crowd of people. There'd be very no difference. But on the inside, in many of you that are here today, there is a power given from God that has literally changed your life, perhaps turned it upside down. We could bring a, a list of people here today who could bear witness to the power of God in their life and how he changed them. That is the treasure that God has given us, the power to break canceled sin, the power to overcome those habits and things that rip you apart, the power to change your heart, the power to have a relationship with God that's inside many of you here today. That is a treasure. It's not just words, but the transforming power of a message. So why is it then that the moment you decide with Jesus Christ and God changes your life and starts to chip away on all those ugly sins and so on, that your external appearance doesn't really change a whole lot? If that was your experience, I know for me, the moment I decided I am in for Jesus, I need his forgiveness, I trust him as my savior, my appearance didn't change, I didn't glow, um, <clears throat> but something very important happened there. God's treasure, the power of his gospel came, his Holy Spirit to reside inside me, and I became a container of a treasure, and yet, as the scripture says here in verse 7, we have this treasure in earthen vessel or in a jar of clay. Genesis chapter 2, if you go back to the very creation when God created men and women, he created us from the dust of the earth. So this idea of a jar of clay is an analogy back to that. It's, 
It's dust, it's dirt of the ground. We are the container for something very precious. We are not the feature. It's very, very hard. We are easily distracted, are we not, by what we can see. The best I could describe or think about this jar of clay, I don't know, maybe you have jar of clay in your, in your home, maybe you love pottery. Some of you maybe even make pottery. I have a tremendous admiration for that. It's beautiful work. We're not talking here though of beautiful pottery. We're talking of the humblest container you could find, just simply almost like a garden pot or a flower pot. Think, think that type of thing. The scripture here is saying that's you. That's your appearance. You're just a humble pot. My children, it's a birthday or Christmas or so on, you know, you get them a toy. It's wrapped in cellophane or it's shrink wrap or cardboard or whatever. All of that, is it not quickly discarded to get to what is the important part, the, the toy or the treasure or what's inside? So could I say in modern terminology, you are the shrink wrap. You are the cellophane. You're the cardboard. Your body, what I see in you and what you see in me, that's not the feature attraction. And it's intentionally that way. Why would God take something as precious as the power of the gospel and reside it inside me and basically no one really knows unless I tell them, the glory is all to him and it's not to me. We are so easily distracted by the rapper, the outward man. Um, I don't know if anyone follows country music. I, I kind of enjoy country music. There was a musician named Granger Smith. Now I'm not too familiar with him. Is anyone familiar with Granger Smith? Fantastic, I saw one hand, there we go. My point is this, a year ago, he had a, had a career that was by all accounts successful in the world's eyes as a musician, traveling around singing songs. He decided a year ago to step away from all of that and to serve in his church in some capacity there. And I came across a quote while I was studying for this passage, I just kind of stumbled along it online on a news site and I thought it was really powerful and interesting, described this really well. Here's by his own words, why he stepped away from his career as a traveling musician to serve in his church. He said this, well, first off, he said, it's a massive ego hit. Going on stage in front of thousands of people, hearing them roar and the lights come on and it's all about you. I raise my hands, they raise their hands. I play loud songs, they get intense. There's a big rush and to leave all that, first of all, it's so healthy to leave that because none of us is made for that. None of us are made to be worshipped in that way. But second of all, it's really difficult because it's addicting. It's really fun to have the spotlight on you. Now, this, this is his words. I'm sharing them on his behalf. He bears testimony that this was a reality. But the point is this. We all have within us some desire to be liked, to have attraction, to have people want to see us, to hear from us, for us to be somewhat of an attraction. And he's admitting that, that that was a reality. He loved that. He said in his own words, it was addicting. But his faith in his Savior told him that this can't continue. And back to our passage here, the treasure that he wanted people to share was not him. You see, the glory was all going to him, to the container, to the cellophane, the shrink wrap, if you will, and not to what he found was really valuable in life, his Savior, the Lord Jesus. But it's hard to step away. God intentionally has made it so that the glory would not go to us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So when we see anything good that comes of us, we can say it was God because we're just weak vessels. God could have forgiven, like he could have literally appeared today. God speak words from heaven. Wouldn't that be amazing? But he has decided through the foolishness, as scripture says, the foolishness of preaching to get his truth out. Why? Could God not do a much better job than any one of us? He absolutely could. But he is trusting that his word taught by his spirit, illumined in our hearts today, that we can hear and see and experience that treasure in spite of a jar of clay like me. So remember our principle, the light is seen when the container is broken. The previous verses, right before verse 7, talked about the God of this world, Satan himself in verse 4, and it talked about how he had blinded the minds of those who believed not, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine in. And Jerry instructed us that that was almost like a smoke, a smoke screen that the enemy, Satan himself, has created in the world, lest people would see the light of the gospel. You have, if you have sided with Jesus Christ, that treasure, that light inside you. But it's not until that container 
gets discarded, broken, starts to fall apart, that that light shows more and more and more. And that's what you're going to see through the rest of this chapter. Persecution and things that pile on. In fact, even at the end, we're going to say the outward man, our body is falling apart. It's perishing. And yet the inward is renewed day by day. The less we can trust our own strength, our own body, the more the light, the treasure is revealed. The light is revealed as the container is broken. So let's continue through the chapter and see how the container starts to get broken down. Verse 8, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. This is Paul speaking about Christians. These are people who have trust in God. And you say, well, if I'm with God, I, my, my path in life's going to be figured out, right? Like, I'll know what steps to take. I'll never have some of these things. Well, that's obviously not the case. In fact, as Jesus Christ promised his followers on the night in which he was betrayed in John chapter 16, he said, in the world, you will have tribulation. You will have hard experiences and hard times. And that's exactly what he's hinting at here. And in, in these four phrases of verse 8 and 9, just to focus on some of them for a bit, perplexed. The word literally means without a way. You don't know where to turn. I'm not asking for a show of hands, but I'd ask you to look at your own heart. Do you ever feel that way? Do you ever feel that I, I just don't know how to go forward? I, I don't know, Lord, what step to take. And you're a follower of Jesus Christ and thought it was all going to be figured out, but yet here we are, we're perplexed. Guess what? Paul was too. That's okay. In fact, it's expected. Perplexed, he says, though, but not forsaken, not in despair, persecuted, suffering for your faith, struck down. That last word there in, in verse 9, or cast down, literally means like you're so discouraged, you're just out. You can't even raise your head. You feel like you can't take another step. Christians, do Christians get to feel that way? Well, once again, here's Paul saying, we. He's part of this group. He's identifying this. There's times when he didn't know where to turn. He was so discouraged, he felt he couldn't go on. All of these things piling up on top of them. But the notice in everyone, it was troubled, but not distressed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed. All of these things pressing on were destroying the very container. The body was failing. Paul suffered so much for his faith. And yet, why, why was he not discouraged? Well, he says in verse 10, we are carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. What on earth does that mean? It means as much as we could approximate what it was for our Savior to suffer in his body as much as he did, do we feel that the follower should have it better than the master? And the answer is no. He suffered immensely, so the expectation is that followers of Jesus are going to experience some of these things as well. As I read these verses, verse 8 and 9, I stopped to reflect and say, you know what, who signs up for this? We had a billboard out on the street today said we want people to be Christians. We want people to follow Christ. Would we add these four bullets? This is going to be part of your experience. You are going to be troubled, distressed, persecuted, forsaken, perplexed, add all these words. Who's in? You see, it's not something that you would be attracted to in your flesh, but it's part and parcel of the experience. So, so how, do we, how do we go on? It's like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we would be of all people most miserable. It would be a horrible existence that you're saying, if everything about the Christian experience stopped at death, if it was just this life, you would be a fool to sign up for it because you experience all these things, horrible things happen, heartache, heartbreak, perplexed, persecuted, trampled down, destroyed, and at the end of it, absolutely nothing to show for. It wouldn't make sense. And you see, that's why your friends, and perhaps some of you even here today, say, you know, as a Christian, you're an idiot. You're a fool. Why would you subject yourselves to those things? I'll tell you why. You subject yourselves to those things because of the verses to follow, because there is a hope beyond the grave. That's the only reason. This body and everything that's suffered in verses 8 and 9 is temporary. But if you believe in your heart that there is an eternity, that there is something beyond this body and this world, that is the reason you continue. That is why you press on. Down to verse 13. We have this same spirit of faith 
As it is written, I believed, and therefore I have spoken. This is Paul quoting Psalm 116, where David said simply those words, I believed, and therefore I speak. Sounds very simple, but what it means is he's speaking from conviction of heart. He decided in his heart that he believed, he had faith that these things were so, that there is a heaven, that there is a hell, that there is an eternity, that there is a God, that all of these things. Now, I don't know many of you here today. I'm delighted that you're here. Some of you may be loving the idea of this is good. I need this for my Christian walk. Some of you may think this is absolute nonsense. Of why are we even talking about this? And in fact, you may be wanting to challenge me and say, preacher, could you prove to me that there is this heaven and hell and God and Jesus and all these things that you speak of? And I'll tell you, as I got many of your attention, I see some eyes come up. Wouldn't we love to see that? Let's see the proof. Okay, let's do it. I could not prove to you in a way that would satisfy your mind that these things are so. I could not say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and answer every objection you have. I reach a point where I consider the facts of Scripture, what I see of my own heart, and what God has done in my own heart, and I believe it to be so. I have faith. I have confidence. You say, well, I don't. That is your prerogative. I would turn the question around on you, though. Um, how do we prove that all these things exist? How do we prove that they don't? And you see, if there is a reality beyond the grave, if there was someone who entered death and came out the other side to tell us about it, hint, there is. We're about to read about him. If that were the case, then I would be a fool to ignore it, wouldn't I? You see, that's this whole, wrapped up in this verse here, verse 13, I believed and therefore I spoke. It all comes back to faith. You have to decide in your own heart, do you believe it to be so? I've said it a million times, I'll say it another million times, the currency of heaven is faith. That is the only currency that God does business with. Your works, your money, nothing you could offer him is of any value until you simply trust what he says. So many times in scripture, that's what God, that is the message of the gospel. Do you believe it to be so? And on your confession of faith, he says you can be forgiven of your sins. It starts with a leap of faith, a trust statement. It's not blind. You make decisions. You consider facts and so on. But ultimately, I believe. And that's why I'm standing up here today to speak. What do we believe in? What is our confidence in? Verse 14, knowing this, he who raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and present us with you. You see, this is the reason to continue that there is a hope beyond the grave. One commentator one time likened the Lord Jesus, he didn't mean to demean him, and I don't mean this to demean him either, but he likened him a bit to Christopher Columbus. You remember the, the narrative where in the 1400s, uh, speculation running wild of what's beyond this body of water that we now know as the Atlantic Ocean. Is there land? Is there world? People could speculate until they were blue in the face. It didn't matter, though, until someone went and came back to tell them about it, that all of a sudden this became real. Jesus Christ is that person for us. He entered death and he came back. He was, he was buried, dead for three days, and yet he was resurrected and seen by the disciples, seen by more than 500 people at once, we read in 1 Corinthians, seen by people walking on the road to Emmaus, hundreds of witnesses, knowing that he is alive, seeing him, it changed their lives forever. He entered, he crossed that Atlantic Ocean, if you will, the threshold of death, came out the other side to prove to us that there is a reality of eternity. And so because we know that someone raised up the Lord Jesus, we know that he can do the same for us. And so we know that it is worth pressing onward, that there is something beyond the grave. For all these things, verse 15, but for your sakes that the abundant grace might through thanksgiving of many increase to the glory of God. That's another reason Paul presses on because he said God's getting more glory the more people get to hear about his message. The last three verses are worth spending our last 10, 15 minutes together. In. Remember, our theme that we laid at the start was the light is seen was the, when the container is broken. We're about to now in these last three verses, 16, 17, 18 of 2 Corinthians 4, just focus in a bit about that container and how it's perishing, how our bodies are falling apart, and yet that doesn't necessarily impact the internal. Let's read them again, and then we'll, we'll unpack. Verse 16, for which cause? 
For all of these reasons, we do not faint. We don't lose heart. We don't give up. Though our outward person perishes, yet the inward is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not to the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, the things which are not seen are eternal. Over and over through this passage, Paul uses that pronoun, we. He puts himself with the believers in it. He says, we do not faint. I trust that's the case for us too, that we realize it is worth going on. Verse 16, middle of the though, though our outward perishes, yet the inward is renewed day by day. Outward and inward. What are we talking about here? Another way to describe this could be material and immaterial. You are comprised of more than just carbon and atoms. The body that we see here today, lovely as they are, this is not just you. If you've ever sadly been in the presence of of an animal or a person who has passed away, the split second after that happened, the body is largely unchanged. Obviously, there's deterioration that rapidly sets in. But we all know that the life, life is gone. That soul, that immaterial part. Now, now how do we talk about this? Uh, John, in 3 John, talked to a friend of his named Gaius, and he said this. He said, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. In other words, he was saying to his good friend, I wish your physical health was as good as your soul's health. Establishing that idea that these are two independent. Your body could be in great shape and your soul could be a mess. Your soul could be in great shape and your body could be a mess. These are independent items. And that's what he's talking about here, the outward and the inward. Now, I do want to go there a little bit. Well, what about this inward? Is it soul is it the spirit? Are they the same? Are they different? This is a hard topic to decide because honestly, it, to me, it's not 100% clear in the scriptures. Now, I'll tell you why I say that. The body is very clear. The part that we see, the outward, the tent, again, the shrink wrap, if you will, we understand that that doesn't get better with age. And anyone could tell us here, as time goes on, things do perish, things fall apart. I don't need to prove that to you. Uh, but the inward, what is it? Well. The, the scriptures do talk about our soul. The scriptures do also talk about a spirit. Are they the same or are they different? Sometimes it appears scripture uses the words independently or, or interchangeably, I mean. But there are other times where a distinction is made. For example, in Hebrews chapter 4, it talks about the word of God being a sharp sword that can divide soul from spirit. So it would seem that there is slightly a difference there. Now, I guess my best opinion today of this inward and what it is Go way back to Genesis chapter 1. The creation of mankind was unique from the creation of all other animal beings. God said, let us create man in my own image. So we're in the image of God and created to have communion with God. So I believe that our soul and spirit, perhaps the spirits inside the soul, I'm not sure exactly how all that works, but I believe our spirit is that which has communion with God. The soul is simply who you are in your life. If you've decided to trust Jesus Christ, your spirit has communion with God. It is through the spirit you pray. It is through the spirit you worship, sing songs, study, and all of those things. If you have nothing to do with God, it's in there, but your spirit is essentially blank, null, blank, dark, darkened. Um, point of this passage, we don't really need to unpack all of that today. The point of it, though, is that we have a material and an immaterial part. One could be healthy and one could not. So how is it possible that one could waste away and the other be very healthy. Well, it's very simple. One is temporary and one is eternal. The body that you have that God has blessed you with today is not forever. It will one day go back to dust. It will one day be, be laid in the ground. Even if the Lord Jesus were to come back today and we were to be caught up in the air to be with him forever, we will be changed and transformed into a new body. This body that you have today will not be with you Forever. And that's how one can be falling apart and one in good shape. So how is it then? Outward man is perishing, yet the inward is renewed. Paul's word here, renewed day by day. Well, what does that word renewed mean? It means, it comes from a Greek word, anakinu, back to new. Almost uh, factory fresh. Back to the original state. Back to how it should have been. 
That, he's saying, is the progress of your immaterial part, your inward part. Was that the case? Is that automatic? That for all of us, we're just, our soul, our spirit is getting more like it should be every day? It's not. For every one of us. It's not for me. There's days when I feel like my spiritual journey is great. There's days when I feel it's flat. I'm sure that's not a surprise to many of you and probably not together, not altogether different from, from your experience as well. However, he's saying here, one could be falling apart, one growing. What is it then that renews this inward? He says in verse 17, light affliction. Remember, the light is seen as the container is broken. As our body, as our outward falls apart, as we have less strength and less ability to trust in our own efforts, all of a sudden, our minds are very easily drawn back to what is the true reality, light affliction. Now, when this verse 17 says light affliction, this is not meant to demean or diminish, rather, the experience that any one of you is going through right now. In a, in a room this size, I guarantee there's some people going through some heavy waters, deep, trying times right now. So the affliction or the trouble that you are experiencing in your life, Paul's not simply dismissing it and saying, oh, it's nothing, it's light, don't worry about it. It's light only in one sense, in duration. It is temporary. It is for this light. Our light affliction, he says, verse 17, is for a moment compared to the far more and exceeding eternal weight of glory. See, back in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, I forget even who led us through that chapter, Paul says at one point he despaired even of life. He wondered if he could even go on. He, he thought he was at the end. Would he call that a light affliction? Well, no, it was very, very real and very, very heavy, but even he would admit it was for that time because he had confidence eternity was there. So is this true? Does affliction on your life Maybe it destroys, it wreaks havoc on your outward person, disease or whatnot, but yet your inward could be renewed. It's not a guarantee. This isn't a contract, but I can tell you I have witnessed this in, in life of my family and times around. I think back 2007, my mother was diagnosed with cancer. At that point in her life, she was a Christian. So was my father. I wouldn't say that my parents were, quote, on fire for the Lord. It wasn't a burning uh, topic in our house. It was just there. We were part of church. We showed up. We did our thing. But it wasn't really a growth. It was kind of around that time when I was in university that I, I was really starting to grow in, in my interest in things of the Lord. I can say, though, uh, so my mom passed away in 2012. So she had five years of cancer. Through that journey, if she was here today, she would tell you that this verse was born out in her life. Her body wasted away over those years of chemo and all of that stuff. Her outward definitely perished. Her inward was never better. Her prayer life, her selflessness, she was on fire in Bible study and all of these things. You see, affliction has, an, has a, an impact on her life. It distills down, doesn't it? A lot of the things that can distract us. If all of a sudden you're faced with a limited time or something serious, severe in your life, you're like, I gotta get my priorities normal. Eternity's coming. It's very easy when your body's healthy and all's good, you don't have an ache or pain in the world to leave God on the shelf, isn't it? When these things strike, though, even if your outward body falls apart, your inward can be renewed day by day. Scripture is once again proven to be true. This, this is true. And so when the container falls apart, the light is seen more. Verse 18, while we look not at the things that are seen, but the things which are not seen. You might be tempted to think in verse 18, well, why doesn't the verse say, look to things future and not things present? But it doesn't say that because the reality is the unseen and seen realm are both in the present. Heaven exists right now. Spiritual realm exists right now. I, I just invite you for a moment to let your eyes look around through the room. Everything you see right now, everything you can see is temporary. The bodies, this beautiful building, the hymn books, our, our friends, our phones, everything you could lay your eyes on right now, it's all temporary. The unseen things, that's the reality. That is eternal. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. Now, I hope so, at least someone's thinking. That's actually impossible. How do I look at something that cannot be seen? Because that's what scripture says there in verse 18. Look at the things which are not seen. Let me give you an example. The scripture gives us an example. Consider God's servant Moses. 
We're back in Exodus at a time when Moses was born at a time when things were very ugly in Egypt. The Hebrews had grown to a certain number where Pharaoh, king of Egypt, no longer, he was concerned that they were going to be large and overthrow. And so he says, the way to limit this population is actually I'm going to make a decree that every male child born in the land of the Hebrews will be killed. Throw them in the river. Moses was born at that time. He had no right to live by the laws of the land. His parents feared the Lord and they, they kept him. They, they hid the baby in their home. It eventually reached a certain point, though, where his mother said, I can't protect my son any longer. She imagine as a mother, as a parent, created a small little boat, a small ark, and set her, her baby, her infant in this thing, pushed it out in the river to uncertain future, saying that it's got, he has a better hope of survival out there on his own in the water than he does in my own home. Miraculously, God allowed that boat to be found by Pharaoh's own daughter. And Pharaoh wouldn't steal this, this child from his own daughter. In fact, how is he going to hurt me? He's going to grow up in my own palace. And so uh, Moses miraculously grew up in the palace of Egypt. He had the best education, the best food, the best life you could imagine. He had wealth beyond control. And yet he reached a point in his life where he realized he preferred to side with God's people and throw that whole life away, be a slave and suffer and be out in the wilderness and all of these things. Throw it all away. Because he believed there was a God and that he wanted to serve his God. By the world's perspective, it's one of the most foolish decisions that has ever been made. To leave the comfort of that place and everything that he had looked after. He was set for life, as we might say. Yet he threw it all away to be a nobody, to live in the desert, and to have nothing. Why? Scriptures tell us. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27, By faith, Moses forsook Egypt. Not fearing the wrath of the king, he endured as seeing him who is invisible it says moses saw the invisible is that a, a contradiction no it's saying the perspective of moses heart he looked and he saw even though he couldn't see god tangibly he knew the reality of his faith in his god and he knew it was better to be on god's side for eternity than to have everything the best in the world and so what this means looking at the unseen make it very practical for you it's in daily decisions in your life are you making them with a perspective of what God would do and how this will impact you in eternity? This is <clears throat> what you give your time to, your money to, what you're involved with. Do those things take away from your spiritual growth in life or do they contribute to it? That's looking at the unseen. Looking to the future, having confidence and faith that there is a heaven, that there is a God, and one day you're going to stand before him and you don't want to say that you disappointed him by making foolish decisions down here on earth. That is looking not at the things that are seen, but the things that are unseen. Jim Elliott was a noteworthy missionary that many, I'm sure, have read the, at least one quotation from his journal that I wrote down here again. Just a beautiful expression. It says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose lose that also is a mind and eye to the unseen giving up anything of the comforts of this life knowing that he is serving one who will reward diligently in eternity you see to, to see the things that are unseen we need a different focus you got to block out distraction if you have distractions of this world in front of you you will never see the things of eternity and the things that are unseen now i, I don't stand up here today saying i figured it all out look at my life don't worry i'm perfect i am the we that Paul is talking about here, very, very much in the trenches with you on this. But it's an exhortation to us all, isn't it? Again, to frame our perspective, to remember the eternal. For the things which are seen are temporary. The things that are not seen are eternal. It's such a powerful and beautiful phrase that boils it all down, doesn't it? Everything you see with your eyes it's one day not going to exist. The eternal, that invisible part inside of you, the health of which is certainly known to you and to the Lord today and perhaps no one else. I can't tell from the containers how well your souls are doing today. The Lord knows, and I hope you know. 
This passage is meant to be an exhortation to us once again to consider the things of this world and the things of this life and the things that are temporary, they're all going to go. To refocus and make decisions now, I believed, therefore I speak. I have confidence that there is an eternity out there to live for. And I make decisions today that seem foolish. I get perplexed. I get persecuted. I get run down. I, I leave comforts of this life. I get called a fool because I believe that there's something else out there in the future that I am living for, seeing the unseen. So if I wrap up this, for a follower of Jesus Christ, you have something very valuable inside you. That is the treasure that was spoken of in verse 7. God has put this treasure, though, in an earthen vessel in a jar of clay. That light of that treasure is only seen as the container is broken. If you trust in the strength of your body and glorify that container, the effectiveness of the power of the gospel in you, not only in your own life to live a life pleasing to God, but in the lives of others, it is diminished greatly. That light is hidden. The light is not effective. As that container, though, wears down, starts to get a few holes, marks, the, the body falls apart, if you will. We trust less in our own strength. It is then that that light is seen by the world and seen by those around us. When Gideon smashed that jar, the light was visible. When the container was completely discarded, the treasure was fully revealed. That will be the truth one day for every follower of Jesus Christ. We shall be like him or we shall see him as he is. So number one, the light is seen when the container is broken. Number two, Christians are not immune to affliction. Trials and tribulations. I trust this was not a surprise to you today. I trust it's not a discouragement. It is reality. We will see that. However, it is through those struggles, trials, afflictions. And again, I'm saying as you're walking through them, it, there's no joy. It's not like, oh, great, this is going to make me a better Christian. It's probably more in reflection. As you emerge from the other side of that, you say, the Lord did a good work in my heart. And it is true. Christians are not immune to affliction, but it is our hope in a future resurrection and life in eternity that allows us to continue. And finally, the reminder of our reality, fix your eyes on the unseen. It sounds impossible. I hope our example of Moses was effective though. He made a decision to forego the comforts of this life and this world, things that were temporary, in favor of more suffering in this life, less comfort, more persecution, being perplexed, all of those things that we talked about in verse eight and nine, he chose them deliberately because he saw the unseen. He saw that there is a reality and he wanted to live for him. The choice is yours. No one will make you today decide to be a Christian. If you believe though that there is a reality to these things, it is the walking through of this life. There is no greater master to serve than Jesus Christ. It's not going to be easy, but it's through the grace and of each other of the power of God's spirit living within us that we continue and know that one day when this body is completely fallen apart, these, the shrink wrap is discarded. Everything temporary is left behind. There will be no regrets in eternity that you served the Lord and sought things that were unseen. Let's pray. Ask God to help us do just that. Father God, we pray for your word to be effective in our lives. We thank you for your word, and I just pray, Lord, that you would help us to understand well what we need to do today. Lord, we are grateful for those who have labored for this uh, meal downstairs, and I was asked to give thanks for that, and so we give you the glory for that as well. I, I trust that our fellowship would be sweet, and thank you for this opportunity once again to be fed from your word and to be fed physically as well. Our bodies are still here. We need physical fuel, but our bodies are falling apart. One day that will be complete, and Lord, we look forward to the day when we are with you and the unseen becomes seen. Father, we pray these things for the glory and honor of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah.